Hello, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Hearing. I'm Brian Taylor. And this week, we're discussing mirror therapy for tinnitus with Klaus Lindman. Uh, Dr. Lindman, we're uh, really pleased to have you with us th uh, this week. Um, and uh, before we talk about mirror therapy for tinnitus, uh, I thought it'd be a really good idea if you could kind of tell our audience a little bit about your background, about your research interests, and maybe what got you uh, involved in mirror therapy for tinnitus. Thank you, and thanks for the the introduction and the opportunity to 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 speak to you guys. Yes, yeah, so my my background is in uh, chronic pain. I mostly study patients with spinal cord injury, and uh, so after spinal cord injury, there's no sensory inflow from uh, below the the lesion level from your your paralyzed legs, but patients still experience uh, a lot of patients still experience neuropathic pain as if it was arising from their legs. And and this is you know thought of uh, and in some ways it can be thought of as a phantom sensation. So there's no actual peripheral sensory inflow. We think rather that the the brain reinterprets those signals uh, and it makes makes sense of those signals by turning it into a, a pain signal. So one of the ways we treat both uh, uh, spinal cord injury and then primarily uh, amputees is. Uh, through mirror therapy. So basically you put up, you take a card, it's very low tech, it's a cardboard box with a mirror inside it. You stick your hand in and you you, you just stick your, your good hand in and your amputated limb in behind the mirror. And that way when you look into the box, it looks as if you have your hand back. Uh, so you, uh, Because your, your good hand is mirrored as if it were in the, the spot of, of the amputated hand. And this actually helps a lot of patients with phantom limb pain because we think the mechanism is that the brain reinterprets the peripheral signals from the amputated limb. Uh, you know, you, you you get your visual feedback. Oh, my hand is back. Then that doesn't make sense to the brain. So it introduces a, a what's called a prediction error uh, that forces us to reinterpret and reevaluate the peripheral signals from the amputated limb. So this is, you know, this was discovered uh, more than 20 years ago and, and it's a common therapy in, in rehab clinics. And then, you know, we, we were thinking about tinnitus and, and, you know, that, that can also be seen as a phantom sound. There's no external source. There, there's no ringing sound in the background, although you experience it. As, a, uh, as an external source. Uh, so can we do something similar for you know, tinnitus? And basically I, I built uh, the first prototype in my garage. It's a pair of headphones that records sound uh, at the left ear and projects it into the right ear and records sound at the right ear and projects it into the left ear. So basically you, you flip the soundscape 180 degrees. So if I snap my fingers, at my right ear, I would hear it in my left ear. Now, obviously, we rely more on vision than on uh, our, on our ears to localize sounds. This, uh, if you think of a ventriloquist, for example, you know the the puppet is is talking. You know that uh, the ventriloquist is doing the talking, and that the puppet is just moving its lips. But since we tend to rely more on our vision than our ears for sound localization. We actually experience that the puppet is doing the talking because this little trick that, you know, our, our brain is very good at making sense of the world, even though our senses are not fully calibrated. Uh, so with, with this flipping of the soundscape 180 degrees, we really mess up how, how the brain interprets it's for uh, its auditory signals, basically telling, uh, uh, or our eyes are basically telling us that there's something wrong with our ears. Every everything is is off by 180 degrees. Uh, so it's 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 a fun little experiment uh, just for uh, uh, to think of you know the psychology of perception, but we also think it may work with uh, to treat uh, phantom sounds or tinnitus. So we. We did a pilot trial that's published now. Uh, it was only 18 people, two people dropped out. Uh, but in the 18 people that 
continued. Uh, it was two weeks of, of wearing these headphones at home for about two hours per day. And in them, we saw a significant reduction in what's called the tinnitus handicap inventory. So self ratings of how much, how bothered they were of, of tinnitus and also a big reduction in the awareness of tinnitus. So what, uh, you know, how many hours per day are you aware that you hear ringing in the ears? And we, we saw reductions that seemed to be kind of dose dependent. So that the longer people wore the headphones, the, the greater the reductions were. Uh, so we think this is a, you know, it's a, it's a new con new approach to tinnitus in some way by maybe not just tar targeting the auditory system, but going up one level and targeting multisensory integration. And uh, we're now we're now doing our second clinical trial, a little bit more rigorous with more audiology measures and and uh, a um, a control condition or a a placebo control or a sham control device. Mm -hmm. And I can't mm -hmm. really tell you any results from that, but uh, right. understood. Uh, yeah. When when might those results be available? I hope we'll be finished with data collection within a month. And then there'll be some, you know, data analysis and processing, and it takes a while to get it published, but hopefully by, uh, well, I, yeah, I don't want to promise anything, but maybe <laughs> the end of the summer, it, it all goes well. Understood. Uh, but I, I, underst I understand it's early in the process here. I'm kind of curious to know a couple of things. Uh, number one, who might be a good candidate for something like this? And if you had any thoughts on that. And then secondly, do you have any ideas or any thoughts on like maybe how many hours a day uh, somebody would have to wear the headphones before they would see some, if they would see any residual inhibition or anything like that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, th those are all part of the questions we're, we're addressing now. Uh, so by, by recruiting a larger sample, we, we can differentiate patients a little bit more and we're doing some hearing testing and some tinnitus matching in these patients as well to kind of get to more objective measures of, of uh, how we might be changing the, the, the experience of tinnitus. Uh, we did not see in the, in the pilot trial, we thought, well, maybe the, the unilateral subjects would be, uh, it would be more beneficial if you have, you know, one-sided tinnitus as opposed to two in both ears. We didn't see any difference uh, between the the unilateral and the bilateral. So so maybe it was just too small of a sample. Yeah, I think it was ten with unilateral and nine or or eight with with bilateral. But uh, yeah, there was uh, n no trend there. So so and and the patients we've been recruiting have been you know just anyone interested from the community. So uh, not the not the worst cases, not the uh, and probably not the the lightest cases either. So you know, just a the, the general sort of population type of tinnitus. That's interesting. Uh, do you think that there is potential that something like this could be built into uh, hearing aids? I hope so. I mean, uh, one of the next steps here is you know, we'll, we'll, after our second trial, we're reaching out to to. Uh, hearing aid makers and and to uh, well you know me medical device makers in general uh, to see you know what what a path forward might be. It's um, we have a patent pending on on the a utility patent on on the approach, mm -hmm. and I think that you know commercializing this, and making it available in uh, to to a lot of people quickly is uh, w would be the best way to to you know to get it out there and, and, you know, I, I don't, since, since, uh, I'm a scientist, I'm not that good of a salesman. So, but you know, if it can help one in 10, then I'll be, I'd be thrilled. Well, and I think clinicians and the public in general, people that suffer from tinnitus, I think they're always looking for, uh, some new solution, some new device that might help because I think we all know in the field that there's no one solution that you need several different kinds of tools in your toolbox to help people with tinnitus. So I think mm -hmm. it's really great to see uh, something like this. And you mentioned to me offline, uh, mirror therapy is uh, on the, the show, uh, Dr. House. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody wants to learn more about it uh, in the world of um, 
and with phantom lens, I guess that'd be a place to look, huh? That it's it's a fun episode. I mean, I mean, it's Doctor House, so he's he's <laughs> maybe not the most empathetic doctor, but but uh, he helps his neighbor. If I put it that way. My my hope is that this is you know uh, it, it's it's quite non invasive. Uh, you know, we're, we're not it, it, we're not giving you know drugs, and we're not there's no surgery or anything like that at all, which are some other approaches. So my hope is that this can be uh, useful for a lot of people. Yeah, no, I think it's great. So, uh, yeah, we're we're pleased that you were able to take some time out of your schedule to be with us. And uh, Dr. Klaus Lindman, uh, we're talking about uh, mirror therapy for tinnitus. Thanks for uh, being on our broadcast today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much.